Tell us what you think, in person, over the phone, online. Watch and hear yourself on TV. You tell us, we air it. This is The Local Live. Good evening and welcome to another episode of The Local Live. As always, I'm Anthony Carlo. And I'm Kat Galliano. We're bringing you the only news show that covers Mamaroneck, Larchmont, and the Rhinec communities. Let's take a look at the news we have tonight. In our roundtable discussion later, we're talking with Mamaroneck School Board Superintendent Ro Dr. Robert Shops about the school budget. What's the new parking resolution on Mamaroneck Avenue? Stay tuned. The Rhinec Boys Lacrosse team made our LMC Varsity Sports Play of the Week. What's a kitchen boutique? Estelle Gourmet Cafe is in the spotlight. And finally, meet our pet of the week. The new parking resolutions proposed by a consulting company was the hot topic at Monday's Mamaroneck Board of Trustees meeting. Here's Sabila Chipaziwa with what happened. Tonight is April 27th and we're at the Mamarnik Village Court where over 20 residents and business owners have voiced their concerns regarding the new parking resolutions on Mamarnik Avenue. We need additional parking and the revenue is a good idea from 6 to 9, but we need more parking, additional parking. Flipping after a two hour period is not going to resolve a long term issue. It's always going to be a problem. The second is that I want to address the issue about the two hour limit in a zone. I went down and I visited Washington, D.C., which uses this system, and I have to say that it really left a bad it taste in to my mouth that because... It said, Mamernak, the friendly village. I would like to know now who stays up at night taking up these cockamamie ideas of turning it to the unfriendly village of Mamernak. Because you guys cannot even enforce what you have in place already. You can't enforce what you have in place already. The changes suggested in the parking study done by Walker Parking Consultants are to have people park on Avenue for two hours between only 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. every day, excluding Sundays and holidays, changing from the current two-hour parking law ending at 6 p.m. A three-hour bar on parking in the zone of Mamaroneck Avenue will be imposed, as the new multimeter system to be installed will take note of license plate numbers and simply moving your car to another spot on Mamaroneck Avenue to be divided into zones 9A and 9B or adding more time to a meter will no longer be allowed. Even before 7.30 p.m., the courtroom was buzzing. The parking resolutions were moved up after the mayor saw the large turnout. Business owners from Robert's Department Store, 360 American Grill, Molly Spillane's and more, as well as residents, let the board know their thoughts on these resolutions that would affect their employees and patrons if passed. And as a restaurant, you're going to come to my restaurant. Thank God we got a good rating. We got a little line outside the door. Okay. Now you wait 20 minutes to eat. You got six of your friends. You come in, you sit in the back, you want to have a drink. It's a beautiful night out. You're limited to not only eating in my restaurant for two hours, but you have to have a chauffeur come bring another car and take your car away so you don't get a ticket because you can't be here for someone. I can understand moving it down or paying extra like the gentleman said. That's, it makes sense, but you're going to chase everybody out of this food town. There's a reason it's a food town. It's a by the water. We've got great restaurants and we have people that pay meters. You want to extend the meters to nine o'clock? Fine. But you can't tell them that after two hours, you're done, you gotta go home. It's, whoever thought of that just wasn't thinking. And I don't know if anybody that thought of that does any business in this town other than being on the board. What about the special needs people, the old people? You got all the reasons here in this room tonight not to do it. You've got all the reasons not to do it. You've got all the reasons not to do it for $75,000, in my opinion. We should be ashamed of ourselves. Suggestions such as charging long-term parkers more to clear a signs pointing to more parking elsewhere were mentioned to the board. Attention was also called to drivers who deal with disabilities and the elderly. Tensions grew, not just from village residents and business owners to the board, 
but also among trustees. Trustee Miller called for politeness and respect twice, especially for Trustee Porak as the public comments drew to a close. To me, to see the disrespect that the community has for a particular individual up here, unfortunately, tonight. Um, it's really, uh, you know, what we do is really hard. And, and I'll tell you, I'm going to say it out right there, what Leon does is really difficult. And, you know, not everything is a win and not every idea is a good idea. But I challenge you to come up with an idea that will put you in front and center and up on the TV every other night and present it to a community to be given feedback on. Discrepancies in the parking study carried out by Walker Parking Consultants were also called to attention, including the observation from business owners that they weren't approached by the company on their thoughts on the study. Mayor Rosenblum himself was not a fan. The two parking resolutions have been tabled until further notice. Well, I think what happened, first of all, I'm totally against it. But what this d clearly demonstrated is democracy works in the village of Mamaronic because I believe the majority of this board was going to pass these two resolutions. And the only reason I didn't pass it was because the overwhelming uh, comments against it. And I, again, I said it publicly before, it's lunacy to do this. Right now, we are the number one destination in Westchester County. We've been rated as number one by two major uh, magazines that uh, we are number one in New York State. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Of course, you always look for revenue. Revenue is nothing more than taxes. The majority of the people that come to the village of Mamaronic, and we estimate at least conservatively two million visitors a year, you're going to scare those people away. It's not too far away that uh, you can go from number one destination to number one joke. And that's what this village is going to turn into if these things are ever passed. It's been over two hours and there's yet to be a resolution. Regardless of the differences in opinion, all can agree that parking is a problem in the friendly village. I'm Sibylla Chipaziwa, reporting for the local live from the Mamanek Village Court. We are going to be following this story and update you as soon as we have more information. At the same municipal meeting, the budget for the village of Amaranek was passed unanimously. If you would like to watch the full meeting, remember that you can always log on to www.lmctv.org. Now it's time for In the Media. Let's take a look at what's trending in our online newspapers. Do you want to find out how many years you have left to live? Well, the Larchman Mamaronic Patch reports that the average life expectancy in the district is 81.6 years, which is about two and a half years more than the national average. This ranks Larchman and Mamaronic 58th among the nation's 435 districts. On a less morbid side of news, a bite-sized playground opened up in the village of Mamaronic according to the Mamaronic Review. The playground is known as the Jewel of Mamaronic and is open for children ages 2 to 5. It features four pieces of equipment that focus on core strength and balance. Mamaronic is gearing up for Mother's Day with an amazing chocolate pop-up shop. The store, titled Chocolations, features products such as truffles, ice cream pop-ups, obviously, and the Make Your Own Chocolate Bark feature. Let me repeat that. You can make your own chocolate bark on the Chocolations website. You can worry about your way tomorrow. With tons of gluten-free products showing up lately, a lot of people have been jumping on the gluten-free diet. Although this diet is great for gluten-sensitive and allergic people, it lacks essential vitamins, minerals, and essentials for a healthy individual. You can find more steps on dealing with the gluten-free diet on Aloha.com. On Friday, Westchester will start applying larvicide to county catch basins. These basins are used to catch rainwater from roads and send it to Earth. To reduce the West Nile virus, this larvicide will prevent the mosquitoes that spread the said virus to breed. Residents are encouraged to remove standing water from their properties, especially right after it rains. And those are our trending stories in the media this week. I'm Christian Sokolay. And we'll be back in just a moment with Superintendent Shaps in our roundtable discussion of the Mamaronic School Budget. Hi, I'm State Senator George Latimer, and I encourage you to watch every week The Local Live. I was going to say something like, I live in Rye, but if I lived in Larch Mart and Mamaronic, I would watch the local live every day. And I just yeah, remind. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hello, I'm Michael Witch, and I'm here to remind you that on May 19th, you are going to have the privilege of voting, voting for your school district budget and voting for members of the Board of Education at the same time. And tonight's topic is the proposed spending plan for the Mamaroneck schools for next year. And uh, as always, you are invited to participate. And I'm here with Rebecca Berman. Hi, Mike. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so please email us, tweet us, and or call in, and we'd love to take your questions on the show tonight. And we're pleased to have as our guest, Dr. Robert Chaps, who is the superintendent of schools in Mamaroneck. Thank you for coming again. It's my pleasure to be here. And we have the air conditioning on for both of us tonight <laughs> to make it a little cooler. Um, I'm going to use a document that you already have on your district website, which is called a budget at a glance, uh, as sort of a template for questions tonight. And, and hopefully you'll be able to uh, give us an illustration or two Absolutely. of some of the things. But I'd like to start uh, at the very bottom of that document, the numbers, um, the big numbers, like the total amount of money that's going to be spent is... It's one hundred thirty-three million eight hundred ninety-eight thousand nine hundred two dollars, I believe. And That's you've got that memorized. Yes. Well, yes. Uh, um, uh, and the budget-to-budget -budget increase over last year. I think it's one point five four percent. I uh, think you're budget, right. Yeah, about two million dollars. And the tax levy increase is a proposed one point five two. Yes, uh, one point okay. seven million above our current tax levy. Okay. Now the legal limit is noted here as 1.89. That's the tax cap? Right. So um, we're really operating in year four with the tax cap law, which right. essentially uh, through a formula, uh, each school system is allowed to grow by a certain result uh, and not exceed that unless they uh, go for a super majority. We have, this is our third um, annual budget that actually is significantly lower than the allowable cap limit. So in this particular mm -hmm. budget, we're actually um, lower by 462,000. And in our first two years, we left, uh, we were lower than 1.5 million uh, mm -hmm. to the allowable limit, and the following year, uh, 1 million. So we, we've tried to understand uh, the impact, uh, certainly the fiscal impact on our taxpayers and tried to match what we need in terms of the support, what I would say is the continuous growth of our school system, but honor the commitment of our taxpayers. So and this also allows the tax rebate program to be in effect for right. our so, taxpayers? Um, so last year was the first year of Governor Cuomo's statewide tax rebate, and we were very happy to, that our budget qualified mm -hmm. for the rebate. And I believe uh, last Friday, uh, the, the numbers came out that 3,500 Mamaroneck residents received a tax rebate. Mm -hmm. And so this year in year two, um, the rebate uh, or eligibility is really based on shared services or long-term savings. Okay. And we believe this budget qualifies for year two of the tax rebate. Well, so that's certainly good news. However, the tax is going up. The school tax would go up under this proposed budget. I believe it is 1.74? Right. It, okay. It's equivalent mm -hmm. to 24 cents per thousand. Okay. And it goes mm -hmm. from um, to $14 per thousand. I think for the average home assessed in, in our community, uh, at 1.1 million, that would be roughly a $263 increase. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to talk, hopefully, about some of the items that uh, that qualify for that. Uh, and before we get into the discussion, I should remind the viewers, if they don't know already, I'm a retired Mamaroneck School uh, teacher. Uh, so uh, full disclosure there, folks. Um, but I'm not in the district. I live in the Rhine Neck district. I, you know, it's interesting. I wanted to mention you started out with the numbers. And yeah. um, what's interesting to me is that throughout our... Uh, budget development process and our presentation to the communities, our emphasis is that the budget's really a collection of numbers, but it really articulates what we value mm -hmm. and what we want to accomplish for our school system. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think it's important to look at it that way because it should represent what we hope for all of our students. I'm glad you brought that up, but I think in the media they always go to the numbers first, first for a reason. I guess it's maybe it's easier to understand or that's what they think that the readers want. Uh, to hear is the numbers. But you're right. Uh, in fact, on the top of the document that I referred to earlier, it, uh, it says engage, empower, inspire, uh, setting the bar high for every student in the district. So well, that is the theme. That is the theme. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're, we're certainly uh, happy within this budget 
to invest in the future and certainly deal with the present. Uh, there are a number of initiatives that uh, we have uh, prioritized, mm -hmm. but to you know, kind of get to the tagline, the idea of to inspire, to empower, to engage, uh, we know when students are engaged in both academic uh, activities and certainly extracurricular, they meet with great success. And so we're trying to certainly focus on the social emotional well-being of our students, our academic well-being, and certainly mm -hmm. the fiscal well-being of our community around sustainability. Yeah. Well, that's a difficult balancing act, is it not? A absolutely. I think certainly um, what I'm most proud about is that between the Board of Education, certainly our stakeholders, we really want to focus on what we believe a Maronic education should look like. So, for mm -hmm. example, um, in terms of new initiatives, yes. we're, we're pleased to uh, roll out uh, next year at Meredith High School, a four-year uh, design sequence. So uh, we, we are fortunate to have a, a, a faculty member who is a graduate of Parsons School of Design. Mm -hmm. um, she worked uh, for quite some time in the real world of design. And we've developed the four-year program that is going to allow students to learn foundational skills and knowledge in, in the field of design. But it culminates uh, in a senior year in a multidisciplinary project. So, this, really is, so this is associated with different departments, not just an art department, it's really it takes the into consideration of all the elements of design, so mm -hmm. marketing, so I would say art, um, mm -hmm. certainly of communications. We're we're looking to partner with an organization that focuses on design to solve problems. So there's a mm -hmm. social constant or element to that that really makes it exciting. So how do our students think about design to solve a problem, to support or advance uh, the needs of society? So it's, it's mm -hmm. exciting. You've got another uh, uh, highlight uh, which is that uh, composter at Homic? Yeah, so uh, I was fortunate to write a grant with uh, Dr. Seth Weitzman and also in collaboration with the Large Walnut Maronite Garbage um, Commission. Yeah. Um, we have been looking to be the first public school system in, in Westchester County to purchase a rocket composter. Our idea, idea here is that how do we kind of embed sustainability education in our schools. Mm -hmm. um, this is a product that is used in higher education at Columbia University in their food system, mm -hmm. St. John's and so forth. Is this like a big machine? It is a it big is? metal composter and okay. so our students really will be at the middle school will be in charge of organizing food waste. That food mm -hmm. waste will be separate and will be put into the rocket composter and in a short time the students will mix uh, wood chips and really look at the, the heat and temperature and really go through the process of managing compost. Our goal is to donate Homix compost to the community for gardens and really support our um, greenhouse at the Hummock School. So it's a great hands-on opportunity. It sounds and like a great it, learning experience. Yeah, absolutely. For these kids. We're excited by it. Yeah. Learning by doing. Exactly. Nothing like it. Uh, and there are there's another program at the high school you're going to add uh, with this budget and that is in graphics. Uh, yes. Know, is it no that's, technology? That, that technology. Well, right. we, mm -hmm. we've had a very strong push the last three years in interest in computer science and mm -hmm. uh, Last year was the first year of our high school robotics program. Our students participated at the regional level in a robotics competition. Um, we developed a three-year course sequence uh, in computer science. We have over 125 students who are enrolled in our computer science program. Uh, next month, a, a group of sophomores will travel to Florida to compete in the American Computer League National Finals. It really mm -hmm. is an international competition. Uh, earlier in the year in the fall, we had over 70 students participate in the Carnegie Mellon University Cyber uh, Security uh, Competition. Mm -hmm. So it extends this idea of learning about coding, but really to kind of test that knowledge in what I would say authentic learning experiences. Mm -hmm. So we're looking to expand it. Um, we are one of the first schools to, to focus on physical computing using Raspberry Pi micro um, processors, really giving mm -hmm. students the connection between how you think about coding and computer science and what the actual products look like. Um, two weeks ago, the board accepted a donation for um, a high-end fridge, a chill fridge um, that is really a smart refrigerator. It, it, it really comes with a number of USB ports 
and allows students to write code and really, um, in some ways, operate a refrigerator to do a lot of things, change in temperature. Um, really, it will really contribute to a lot of experiences, whether it's our research program or computer science program. Mm -hmm. So the, the overarching theme really is how do we encourage authentic learning? How do we allow students to gain the skills and knowledge for the future? And that is technology mm -hmm. in many ways. It's uh, STEAM and STEM, oh, and we're excited by it. Well, STEM we know is science, engineering, technology. Science, technology, engineering, and math. Okay. Uh, and STEAM adds word. the art component into exactly. it. And yeah. I, I think um, we are certainly fortunate to have a great relationship with our STEM Alliance in their community. Mm -hmm. um, in two weeks, we'll have our second annual STEM-tastic day. Um, at the elementary and middle schools, our students are doing a number of activities that are, you know, really talk to this idea of tinkering, developing, mm -hmm. uh, maker, we would say, opportunity to really uh, learn about hands-on activities. And our goal is to expand it through this budget. Mm -hmm. The timing is great because um, New York State is about to adopt the next generation science standards. So in this budget, we really have added a number of resources for, for our students, but also to have a vision for K-12 science education in the years ahead through professional development. We're working with uh, Dr. Helen Pashley, who is a zoologist, and mm -hmm. really focusing on restructuring our K-12 science education. You haven't left sports out of the budget either. You've managed to, in this budget, you've managed to restore some athletic teams that were yeah, cut Yeah, there are really two important areas, I think, of engagement that is uh, part of this budget. First, um, in 2010, the Board of Education eliminated seven teams, and uh, for the last, really, five years, uh, our community have, has really rallied to uh, raise funds to reinstate the teams through donations. Mm -hmm. uh, we felt, given the, the strong interests of our students, it was time to think about um, adding back. So we are adding four teams back into our athletic program and adding the fifth team that is uh, with the popularity is boys lacrosse, a second yeah. modified boys lacrosse team. At the same time, our K-12 music program of band, orchestra, and chorus has been growing incredibly um, mm -hmm. in, in terms of interest. And so through this budget, we're actually increasing our staffing at the elementary level for band and orchestra to really mm -hmm. accommodate the growing number of students who are playing instruments and are singing. We want to ensure to maintain the quality of our program, so the staffing is an important piece to that. I'm sorry to make you jump around from one topic to another, but the, the literacy ambassador, Yes, I think I read about that in the uh, Mamaroneck Review. Can you explain what Cer that is? I, certainly. I, I think there's two pieces to it. For the last mm -hmm. several years, we're really focusing on how reading really is, is central to academic success, that is, across mm -hmm. disciplines. Um, in our elementary schools, we have, as we say, 2,600 readers. And our job is really promote the love of reading, but it's this idea that the research really points to high volume of high success reading. So the more we can put books in the hands of our students and, mm -hmm. and really ensure they, they go up the ladder of text complexity, we know that that will focus on critical thinking skills, comprehension. And so the literacy ambassador position um, is really designed to focus on one, um, to ensure consistency of our classroom libraries. We don't use a basal reader or reading program. So it's our, our rich libraries that really mm -hmm. allow us teachers to put books in the hands of each student and, and really choice of books. So the first uh, aspect of this new position is to really ensure that across our four schools, our classroom libraries are up to date. So it's really mm -hmm. a curator's role. The second is to support teacher and librarian, librarians in this idea of book matching. So if you like chapter books, it's how do we find and ensure that as a student you have those just right books. Um, and so it's really working across the district. And finally, we really believe the formula for success in reading is tied to the school-home partnership. And so working with community, working with parents to really ensure that reading is happening all the time is critically important. Mm -hmm. So we feel it's, a, it's, it's, it's part of the theme of investing in the future as mm -hmm. well. So it's, 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 a, it's a good initiative. Uh, at the same time that you're making, that you're adding staff positions, uh, the, the Board of Ed also is proposing cuts. I think it's 2.5 <coughs> yes. positions and right. are there I, I think the reductions, special education? Sure, the reductions are really, um, as, you, as you mentioned, are aligned to changes in certain student populations, so the needs of students, mm -hmm. um, and also efficiencies around clerical staff. So, um, you know, we're pleased that we're adding a, and certainly investing in, in, in significant uh, staffing increases at the same time, year to year when we see opportunities to, for reductions, mm -hmm. Um, we do identify reductions in staff 
and, and make those recommendations to the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. Is the board mindful of the, you know, down the road, you, in, you, you staff needs support, health insurance, pensions, and all that stuff. Is that built into or is that for planned ahead of time? For Absolutely. The following I, years? I think um, we, we have certainly spent a lot of time in the fall through our finance committee identifying our fiscal priorities that really support uh, the sustainability of the, of the district over time. So when we budget, it's not just for one budget year. It's really thinking look broadly over the next several years to your mm -hmm. point. Um, there are several things to talk about with specific to that um, question about staffing and the impact over time. Mm. The first thing is that since 2010, our enrollment has increased by 5%. And mm. so for the last several years under the tax cap, we really haven't been able to invest in staffing. And, and at this point, because of our elementary uh, class size guidelines, because of our increased enrollment at the middle school, we're mm. well over 1,200 students now. Um, we find it necessary to keep class sizes down and invest in staff. For some people who just don't understand the whole idea of maintaining class sizes, as a former classroom teacher, it's important that, that numbers not be overwhelming. I mean, because education is different these days. Sure. <laughs> it's not a lecture right. to I, a group of 30 kids. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I think, number one, we believe that quality teaching is the most important aspect mm -hmm. of that experience. And so uh, finding the highest quality teacher and supporting teachers in the growth of their work is critically important. That being said, uh, the board has adopted class size guidelines. We know that um, in, in, in terms of learning, that the more mm -hmm. a teacher can give full attention to fewer students, yeah. uh, certainly we optimize and create those conditions. Um, I, I, in terms of the next several years, we do anticipate to see a number of retirements. Mm -hmm. And so as we add staff and, and our staff changes, our overall budget for staffing mm -hmm. will balance out. Also, this is the first year that we've seen significant savings in the reduction of pension uh, contributions. So mm -hmm. um, from, from that aspect, it, we're able to really invest in new staff based on some savings in two major areas. One um, is lower contribution rates for pension, which is the first year, mm -hmm. um, and we anticipate that will continue over the next several years. Um, the second is that we um, turn, switch to a self-pay health insurance for all of our employees and retirees. Mm -hmm. and through through that process, for the last two years, we've been able to save over $2 million to the taxpayers. So again, mm -hmm. when you combine both the uh, pension contribution reductions and then the savings from health, it really allows us to grow our budget, mm -hmm. but manage uh, to take advantage of savings. The, the committee that uh, guides the Board of Education, is that a fair term guide? Does it offer suggestions, this fin the financial sure. committee? So when I arrived in the district in 2010, um, I suggested that we bring the community in, uh, in terms of ensuring transparency, but mm -hmm. also taking advantage of of the, the professional knowledge and interests of our community members. And mm -hmm. so uh, we established a Citizens Finance uh, Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting, in the first couple of years, we really charged them to focus on specific projects like analyzing our tax tertiary reserve or looking um, at the ratio of reserves and so forth and mm -hmm. so on, but also to uh, this idea of advice and consent. They really were a part of the budget development process and allowed mm -hmm. them to fully understand our long-term plan. So that's been in place for, the, for certainly the last uh, five years, and we've really appreciated their, their point of view. And it's more to advise and, and provide mm -hmm. a sounding board based on their level of interest and expertise. So when the board reduced its, uh, its reserves, for certiaries and, and things like that. That is a result of the advice? That sure, that would be an example. So uh, three years ago, we asked them to look at, try and give us some formula that would, or at least in some ways, give some rationale and mm -hmm. a basis for uh, setting aside reserves for in anticipation of tax tertiary settlements. And so that work has led to um, certainly uh, our adopting a particular strategy. I think similarly, you know, the Finance Committee this year was very much interested in lowering the ratio, overall ratio of our reserves. And through mm -hmm. this budget, we've been able to reduce several reserve categories that are restricted, like unemployment reserves, mm -hmm. uh, workman compensation reserves. Um, and also, so, so the idea is to say, how can we demonstrate fiscal responsibility over time by slowly reducing um, reliance on reserves? And, and this budget reflects that. At the same time, we have had, we, we've continued with the practice of using fund balance to actually lowering our overall tax levy. So mm -hmm. you started out by talking about 
um, the risk, you know, how do we keep taxes down? Right. And um, the we we really have been relying on fund balance to um, to lower the, the levy the following year, and now we've made a commitment to reduce our reliance on that as well. So that's the second example mm -hmm. of fiscal responsibility. Yeah. Um, a question has come in. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any changes in, um, on the transportation school policy? No, actually, they're, they're, they're <clears throat> the board adopted a, a new policy last year. This is the first year of that policy. Um, we actually found um, um, that the anticipated savings uh, that we would thought we would realize is really coming through this year, and so mm -hmm. we're planning to continue to keep that policy intact going forward. Is there is there uh, ever a temptation by one or more board members to say, well, let's take this extra money and you know? reverse our decision from last year? No, I, I think, and again, um, you know, we have been fortunate to identify a number of efficiencies yeah. um, over the last uh, five years and to, s to operate on the assumption that we need to reduce in order to, to, to grow in certain areas. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we don't, we, we take every situation or any decision seriously and invest time and effort to really understand the, the, certainly the, how that decision will help us in the long haul. Um, I, I think the transportation decision, the athletics decisions, um, it, it allows us to look broadly and, and really prioritize. And we feel in, in, in this regard that the decision to change the policy will support savings over time. Mm -hmm. and, it, and so far, it's worked out that way. To those, we're almost out of time, but I just wanted to ask one more question. To those who say um, there was an increase in state aid, right? Sure. Uh, unexpected state aid, I believe. Uh, apply it to tax relief. Just reduce everybody's taxes. Sure. What do you say to those folks? I mean, personally, as a teacher, I think investing in kids is like the best investment you could make. Sure. I would say that we, we've been able to accomplish all the above. Um, we receive mm -hmm. $200,000, or we expect to just receive $200,000 more in state aid. So we did not necessarily gain that, um, that certainly advantage oh, compared uh, that to area. Oh, was built in? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, but I would say that as we, we have uh, anticipated the increase in state aid, we also reduced uh, this budget from where we started. And, mm -hmm. and I think, again, I'm most proud of the fact that we uh, certainly are eligible through this budget for a rebate. Uh, two, that we are lower than the allowable cap by almost $500,000. Mm -hmm. So we are sensitive to this idea mm -hmm. of our taxpayers and their commitment to our school system. And those who are not parents but still live in the community and still pay taxes, the value of the schools for them? The value is on, on the strength of the product. Uh, you know, it's interesting, many school districts in the area are, are f having declining enrollment. We are increasing. And I, I like to believe that it's attributed to the programs we offer, the experiences, the type of education our students enjoy, and the mm -hmm. results of, the, of, of this education. So I, I think I would say is that having a strong public school system really will ensure property values and the interest to, to move and live in the American large market. And not to mention that there are plenty of programs that the schools offer that are available to all residents. Absolutely. You don't uh, have to have children uh, in the school district. I think the partnership between the school system and the broader community is critically important and the board mm -hmm. this year will certainly uh, went on a community listening tour, really sought input mm -hmm. from its citizens, and we want to bring as many people as we can into the school to volunteer, to be a part of our concerts, and really just enjoy the fruits of a strong public mm -hmm. school system. Well, this has been very informative. Uh, I'd like to remind you folks that you can still register to vote if you're not registered. May 14th is the last day to register in the school district office uh, on Boston Post Road. Uh, and the absentee ballot is on the website. And there's lots of information on the school district website. I mean, we've touched a little bit on it tonight, but uh, there's lots of information yeah. there. Well, if we had more time, I, I, I could tell you more, but it's, been, it's a great <laughs> opportunity to, to speak about mm -hmm. where we're at and the budget we've put forth to our voters and certainly looking forward to May 19th. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Robert Chapp, Superintendent of Schools in Mamaroneck. Uh, wish you well in the next thank vote. You and uh, stay tuned. We have more local news coming right up after this. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Hey guys, you're watching The Local Live. Stay tuned. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> This week in sports, the Rhineck boys lacrosse team kept rolling along with a 10-9 win over Dobbs Ferry, improving their record to 10-3. In the third quarter, a ground ball turned into a piece of offensive mastery in the LMC Varsity Sports Play of the Week. And still loses, Bloom fights for it, and he's got it. 
Cameron Bruma loads to Sevion, who's got an advantage out in front. He passes, shot, score. Tremendously executed. Cameron Broom noticing that Sevion is fast and open, found the ball, got it to him. And Sevion got the defenders the commit, found Gottlieb, and a quick catch and shoot. 9 5 Ryan Neck. It amazes me how these kids play so many different sports. I mean, Sevillon and Gottlieb, I remember calling their football games. Now it's lacrosse. It's unbelievable, the athleticism. And I'm biased. I'm a Ryan Egg Panther, so <laughs> I'm an alum. So for this week's In the Spotlight, we feature a new French cafe called Estelle Gourmet that has opened on Palmer Avenue in Larchmont. They offer French cuisine, catering, and cooking classes with healthy, balanced meals for all who are interested. I was there, so here's the story. We're here in the village of Larchmont at Estelle Gourmet, which specializes in French cuisine, catering, and also offers classes. We're going to meet with Estelle herself, who's going to give us an inside look at one of her lessons. Owner and chef Estelle Labrush hails from Paris, France, where she has had a passion for cooking since she was a young girl. After being a private chef for over two years, she is now taking on Larchmont with her own storefront. You can enjoy some pastry, soups, and crepes, or else sign up for a private cooking class where she will show you how to make some traditional French dishes. We popped into today's private lesson where Estelle was busy cooking up a storm with the ladies. We even got to sample some of the dishes, and let me just say, they were even more delicious than they look. Estelle's vision for her cooking boutique is simple. It's about good food and a great atmosphere. I think for me, what is very important, because uh, the cuisine we can always learn it at school or have a very nice technique. But for me, what is very important is the flavor and the quality of the, the ingredients. So that is what I want people to feel first, is very, uh, the spirit of the food. It's not only uh, uh, put uh, everything together with nice technique, but the food should speak to the people. And lastly, we asked Estelle how she would describe her food. Well, let's just say she couldn't just pick one. One word uh, will be passion and flavor and love. It's not one word, but three words. <laughs> it's okay. That's how good it is, ladies and gentlemen. So There's we, three words. Yeah, because we are generous. That is why. <laughs> so passion, flavor, and love. If you're in the mood for great food and friendly hospitality, check out Estelle Gourmet. This is Kat Galliano for The Local Live. And the local live on LMC TV. Our pet of the week is Abby. If you would like to meet and adopt her, contact the New Rochelle Humane Society at www.newrochellehumanesociety.org. As always, for more information on the stories you just saw, visit our website, lmctv.org. And any concerns, questions, or comments, make sure to email us and email us at the local live at lmctv.org. I'm Anthony Carlo. And I'm Kat Galliano. We'll see you next week on another episode of The Local Live. Take care. Tell us what you think. In person, over the phone, online. Watch and hear yourself on TV. You tell us, we air it. This is The Local Live.